Top Bird Talk. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this afternoon the second perioptive exercise testing and training society here at EPOM, where we will be discussing multimodal prehabilitation and in particular the lived experience of clinicians from different healthcare systems from Europe, United States and the UK, both prior to and during the pandemic. And we will be hearing about the experience of implementation of prehabilitation programs and also from research studies and how these programs have managed to adapt in the COVID era. And so in the first instance, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Stefan van Rugen. Stefan is a reformed surgeon, I like to think of him as such, from the Netherlands, who initially became interested in prehabilitation when working with Harit, who we met earlier today, Sluter in Eindhoven, and also with Franco Carli's group from Montreal. And his PhD thesis involved the training of colorectal cancer patients prior to surgery. But Stefan has become so passionate about uh, the importance of prehabilitation that he has now moved to become a general physician in primary care. Part of his job is now focusing on the countrywide implementation of prehabilitation in primary care before surgery. So welcome, Stefan. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for the uh, invitation. It's great to see you. Some of you may have had the opportunity to see Stefan's talk and Stefan talked a lot about First of all, the epidemiology of physical inactivity and what a big challenge it is for healthcare professionals generally. I just wondered, Stefan, what your insight is into why it is that doctors perhaps don't always address health behaviours when they see patients in surgical or medical clinics? That's a very important question because if we don't address it, how would patients be able to know about the benefits of being active and to change their lifestyles and the sedentary behaviour when they don't have the tools to do so. So yeah, in my experience, both in the hospital care and primary care, I do see yeah, several aspects why we don't do it. First of all, I am trained as a basic physician now seven years ago. So in my medical studies, I haven't heard anything about what lifestyle change or behavior would be, how that could be beneficial for patients. So we didn't have any training in that not about nutritional aspect, not about the activity, neither about good stopping smoking cessation programs or addressing alcohol behavior, not even talked about the importance of being mentally healthy. So it's part of, you know, training, it isn't addressed. So now we have in our country, we have a foundation of students, it's called students and lifestyle that now are addressing this as well. So they manage to have 60 hours of lifestyle training for physicians in the basic medical training. So I think that's a very, very good progression. But it means also that we as more trained physicians, we don't have the tools to really address it. On the other hand, if I look now at my GP practice, I just counted it past months, 60 to 70% of patients I do see with their symptoms are lifestyle related. On the other hand, what patients want, for example, they come with shoulder problems or any other knee issues, uh, they want to be referred to a physiotherapist or either get medications to be improved. But their willingness to talk about lifestyle change or being less overweight, that's a bigger challenge for them. And it's not the third thing they want to talk about. So it really means that as a physician, you need to address that in a way that you meet the willingness at the level where the patient stands. So I got very interested the past years in the behavioral change and how to impact that and how to get this message rolling. And I do think there's great sentences and ways to even when a patient comes for a skin problem, but it has obesity or is very overweight, that you can still address that lifestyle is important. But that needs training as well. Sure. Do you have any particular tips from the behavior change literature which clinicians could incorporate easily into their practice when trying to talk to patients? Are there any techniques that improve the effectiveness of advice? Absolutely. And there are very easy things to implement as well. So it already starts with just creating more awareness of the importance of being fit and to improve activity level, etc just by, for example, in the waiting room, show the benefits of being active. Just by a poster or uh, now in, 
in waiting rooms, there are several of those screens that you can have some slides going on. And that already makes or creates more awareness by people. And then already a seed is planted. So when they enter your room to have other things discussed, you can just refer to that. Yeah, that's great. One of the other challenges we talked about a little bit this morning when we were talking about preoperative nutrition was the integration of services between primary and secondary care. Because obviously as a primary care physician, you're the first to see the patient and it would be good to start prehab then, but it, it's sometimes been difficult to integrate. Have you got any tips from your experience in Holland about how that MDT across primary and secondary care works effectively? Yeah, I think that is one of the biggest challenges that is left now uh, after we, we managed to get a very a good prehabilitation program rolling in hospital care. We have now a huge challenge to bring that to primary care. And I believe that we became very good in our own silos, but we forgot to collaborate in this, in primary care and hospital care. And I'm now looking into that actually uh, one day a week to create a network that build that bridges to make it possible. And because it's not only focused on the content of it, because as professionals, we are very good in creating the content and that's not a a very a difficult thing to address, but it's also that you have to create other pathways to get the money rolling. So for example, our health insurances pay hospitals to get some or the prehabilitation program done. But if we want to get the training done by a, f a physician or a physiotherapist in primary care, the way the money rolls is also in that way very difficult. So what I experience is very helpful uh, to do is to get insight in how those systems relate to each other, not only by the content and which professionals are involved, but also the health insurance companies and other companies that can support your program, for example, in data management. Sure, that seems a good uh, moment to bring in our second speaker, who is Professor Jerry Donjou. Jerry is a professor in anesthesia and sleep medicine in South Teason at the University of Hull and York, but also has had a very large role in driving prehabilitation forward in the UK. And in particular, he was talking in his talk to us today is, are we ready for prehab? Is prehab ready for the prime time? Have we reached the tipping point? And Jerry, I was going to ask you from your work with patients, have you really felt that patients are ready for behavior change? I think so. And the patients that we approach, the patients that we engage uh, definitely seem ready. Obviously, we can't reach everybody and everybody has different needs and there are choices to be had about how we deliver these things to patients. But I think by and large, our work is suggesting that there's a lot of patient support for prehab and taking these initiatives forwards. And I think that's supported by uh, the messages that are coming out from research and also innovations elsewhere in the UK and also elsewhere internationally. And I know that with the development of your prehab programme, you worked both with patients and also with public health and primary care. Did you find that that was easy to work across the systems? or were there a lot of barriers certainly? Initially, we encountered some barriers. We were fortunate enough to get some pump prime funding initially through the Health Foundation. And more latterly, our program is funded by Sport England. And that kind of changes the conversation slightly. I think it's important to say though, that once we got the pump prime funding, that there was um, certainly greater will from the other partners, including the trust and public health and primary care to provide a degree of match funding to the endeavors. There certainly was no lack of want to support the program, but as we see repeatedly, it often kind of distills down to where the finances might come from, but we've been fortunate to not have to worry about that more recently. And was it your experience that in the absence of support, patients have the tools to be able to implement prehab or behavior change on their own? Or did the majority of patients you come across need a bit more support in the form of some sort of supervision? Well, I think the message that our research has shown is pretty loud and clear that patients perhaps lack the confidence to achieve that support. And I think one of the difficulties from our patient engagement work and also our research is that people who may have multiple adverse behaviors, they might smoke or they might be inactive, and asking them to go to two or three different places before a, a major life event like surgery is kind of not gonna be well supported by patients. And certainly within our model, when we started off, we wanted to 
be able to provide that all in-house in a one-stop kind of facility. And that was certainly well received. So they didn't have to worry about going A, B and then to C for the support we were looking for. And was that in a hospital or was it in the community, your centre? That was based in the community. We chose a fairly central facility with good access for public transport, for parking. And it's a nice public health gym facility with a room at the back where patients can do their sessions privately together. So they're not in the main gym, but they have the flexibility to go in the main gym as well with the health trainers and health physiotherapists if, if, if they decide they want to do that. Did you find a similar thing, Stefan? Absolutely. Although we are a very small country, the hospital, academic hospital I'm working at now, Radboud University Medical Center, does have a wide spread of where patients come from. So some of them have to move through all the country or half of the country to get there. So since we, uh, in one year now, provided them with training in their own community, we see that that very helps with the compliance and to, yeah, to finish the trainings. And patients are very happy with that. And from my earlier experience as well, when you have older patients and they also taking care, for example, for their partners, they love it or it's more helpful if they can just train in their own streets or at community level. It seems to be a very consistent message from the literature that adherence is much greater if the program is supervised in some shape or form. Would you agree with that? Is that your both of your experience? Definitely, yes. I think that's definitely the experience. and. I think also to really achieve the benefits that we want in the time available, that could be more easily achieved in a supervised kind of environment. But we faced those challenges in the last 18 months um, in being able to achieve that, but hopefully those opportunities are going to come back online in the near future. I also agree it, it very needs supervision, but it doesn't depend on where that supervision has been given. So we are now creating some quality criteria for those professionals that do this supervision. So for example, it has to be a physiotherapist with a certain educational degree. They need to have the right materials uh, to train how our protocol is. And then we do believe that everyone can be trained at almost every spot in the community. One of the things that we've seen at international meetings is that the workforce that's available is very different in different countries. So some countries have kinesiologists, some have exercise physiologists, clinical exercise physiologists. And when looking at the workforce, I wonder what's your opinion about, does it need to be a, a particular type of health professional or is it, is it more the competencies they have to deliver the various elements of prehab? I would say it's the latter. I don't think it has to be a specific group of healthcare professionals. It doesn't necessarily need to be healthcare professionals at all. A lot of our programs being successfully delivered by um, health trainers from public health. Um, and, you know, I think it's more around the fidelity of delivery and the competence of delivery that's important rather than who the actual person is delivering the, the programme. And also can make that more cost effective when expanding to large numbers of patients, I would have thought as well. Definitely. It can almost have the cost of the intervention of uh, just for a few weeks. And is, as a result of that, one of the key stages would seem to be screening and assessing patients' needs. Because we all know, as you've already alluded to, Jerry, some patients you get a cluster of difficult behaviours all at once. Other patients may only have a problem with physical lack of activity. It seems important that we early in the process of prehab actually identify what a patient's needs are. Have you got any tools that you use to do that in your programs? Yeah, we now summed up the screening and assessment tools that are available and to make a decision in who's performing the screening and who's performing the assessment on all the aspects of multimodal prehabilitation. So from the early beginning, we know on which of one of the aspects a patient can improve. On the other hand, when a patient goes into the prehabilitation program of only four to eight weeks in our country, the main part of the program is exercise. And to do that supervised on a high intensity based. So I think the, the biggest impact of the program is part of the exercise as well, in combination with the protein supplements. So I don't really believe that the initial screening or assessment would differ the outcomes of that first four to eight weeks. However, when you want to continuous lifestyle change or go into rehabilitation, I think it's even more important to 
address those all the aspects in the beginning so you know what to continue on in the end and what's your experience jerry have you been using specific tools early in the pathway yeah so initially when we set out on the journey we had uh, we modeled our offer on uh, cardiac rehabilitation so we had an entry assessment with kind of health questionnaire quality of life questionnaires and then we did brief kind of validated tests like six minute walk test assessment of frailty stop bang score for obstructive sleep apnea and so on and also looked at self-reported physical activity levels when we were kind of uh, driven underground slightly in the last 18 months we've kind of rapidly innovated and we now have a digital platform which supports our program and rather than patients having to come in we're able to register them and they can now do all of our assessments and in, in their kind of privacy of their own home and their own time and then that's followed up by our project managers with a telephone call and we retrieve all of this information on the platform and it calculates things like IPAC scores and physical activity scores and also their METS equivalents and, and general risk. And we found that although it was a lot of work, as you might imagine, to put together, it's, it's been a huge benefit to our program and in a slightly difficult time. This seems like a good moment to introduce our next speaker who also has had some experience of adapting prehab programs during the pandemic so it gives me great pleasure to introduce professor sandy jack who is one of my colleagues who i work with in southampton and sandy has been a leading light in prehabilitation medicine particularly in the research arena and has worked with several multi-center studies uh, looking first at exercise prehab but more recently a multimodal prehab sandy I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experience with first your WestFit study and then how you adapted things when COVID hit. The Wessex Fit for Cancer Surgery trial was delivered predominantly in the community. We did sometimes on very rare occasions do some of the exercise training in hospital for the first couple of sessions if we were really concerned about a patient. So I guess we were delivering more of the specialist level on only probably about 5% of the patients. So we were able to translate everything that we've done in hospital for our previous studies over the last 10 years or so to deliver exactly the same fidelity validity of the training program in the gyms. We prescribed the training program from the cardiopulmonary exercise tests that they had prior to their enrollment in or recruitment to the trial and then we will be able to deliver these on cloud-based bikes in community gyms with personal trainers and level three personal trainers who also were trained in healthy conversations. We had a really good adherence rate in over 270 patients now of 84% and this is across the board of two weeks minimum and 15 weeks maximum depending on whether patients were straight to surgery or they were having neoadjuvant treatment as well. It was really well accepted by patients. They always complain about parking. Uh, they liked the fact they could go to the gym. They liked the fact they could go to the gym and they weren't identified as a patient with cancer. They were just going to the gym. And they also went to the cancer support centres to have their psychological support. So it seems to be a model that is accepted to patients. We certainly have behaviour change in Westfit because we had people going off and buying bikes and we signposted them after they finished the intervention part of the trial to go to other community settings. So it seemed to be relatively well, quite well accepted and, and a sustainable and cost effective model. So just to clarify, patients were happy to train for up to 15 weeks during neoadjuvant treatments? Yes, at their request, it was their decision on our patient focus group that it was for that long. We initially thought we would train them after neoadjuvant, but they requested they wanted it for the whole time. So I think that's another point which is sometimes overlooked in the design of prehabilitation programmes and some of the guidance that came out recently from the Royal College in Macmillan focused on the importance of actually involving patients in the design of a prehab programme, because I think we have inherent biases about what we might think patients want to do which may actually not be what they do want to do. I think this is the most important aspect of the whole program. I was very lucky that I got in contact in 2015 for the first time that I started with prehabilitation with one patient that experienced bowel cancer and he was available and willing to help us in just designing the program and they came up with very interesting thoughts on that. So he was inviting us to the nationwide patient organization that looked into all our protocols. And I can only say that they are very 
very important to be included in the project uh, team. Yeah. And so, Sandy, what happened with the advent of COVID to your programme? We've heard how Jerry's managed to adapt. What's happened with Westfit? We had to pause Westfit the week before, the weekend before we went into lockdown, and we had nine patients on trial that we had to ring up, and they were completely devastated. Um, we said to our patients at the start of the trial, we're going to be with you as a team throughout this to get you through your surgery and beyond. And then I really felt that I'd let the patients down. So I was really lucky to have a network of colleagues, friends, stakeholders that we all pulled together, managed to get some pump primary money from Macmillan and set up SafeFit, which is basically a self-referral uh, system service trial that was initially through Macmillan website that's now on an NHS England website where we're able to deliver virtual clinics for exercise which is supervised exercise sessions, nutritional support and emotional or psychological support and behaviour change all, all delivered by can rehab instructors who are basically exercise instructors that we upskilled to deliver the other interventions and behaviour change so it's £360 for a six month programme to support them. That seems ex very little money for the benefits that may the work uh, from the, cost the sort of exercise that you're doing in SafeFit or we're doing we've heard we've heard little bit snippets about the type of exercise but much of the literature at the moment where exercise has been most clinically effective seems to be aerobic exercise would you agree with that that's really to all of the panel um, and high intensity exercise or interval exercise seems to specifically have had the highest signal in many of the studies. I completely agree. So we're able to do that because they have been using weighted skipping ropes and we do know that some of the patients that have had pelvic exenterations have even benefited from having shorter length of stay. Um, anecdotally from Malcolm West who, who's working in London on this particular cohort and we do do resistance training with cans of beans or pears so because it's a one-on-one -on -one virtual session with the trainer doing exactly the same thing in front of the patient we think that we probably do more than universal it's probably a soft targeted supervised exercise training. And just for those of us who aren't familiar with that terminology would you explain to me by what you mean by universal or soft tar or targeted oh, or specialist so it's on the in the guidelines but also on our comprehensive model of personalized care from the long-term plan universal is supposed to be advice but we think it should be supportive self-management targeted is more uh, for a more complex uh, patients that are not fit uh, metabolically psychologically or physically and then specialist is the really complex needs so if we're saying that it's universal then it should really just be advice or support yourself management but actually we're doing something in between those two levels really so we're delivering probably more like jerry's been delivering i would say the thing about high intensity just building on what sandy said i think high intensity training is often more enjoyable for patients as well moderate continuous level exercise for 45 minutes can possibly be a bit boring and if you want to have good engagement and people are coming back each time for the sessions, I think high intensity offers a little bit more in the way of kind of enjoyment and reward. And some of the great stuff to come out of the pandemic has been the opportunity to do virtual classes with our physiotherapists where we're basically running Zoom classes. Patients are wearing kind of heart rate belts and their percent of predicted maximum heart rate is displaying on the screen. So we can have a spotter who's appropriately qualified to keep an eye on the 10 patients in the class to make sure that everybody's exercising safely. And I know that John Moore in Manchester has been doing a fair bit of work in that area as well. And I think patients are really enjoying that opportunity. And these are creating a menu of choices moving forwards because not everybody wants to come into a gym. And this has really sort of created a adverse situation, created an opportunity for us to really explore what works. And Sandy, has that self-referral program been popular to date? Uh, extremely Safest. popular, Danny. We've been inundated with patients. When we first opened and we had some media coverage, we had 200 self-referrals within 48 hours. And we were able to track the trends of the COVID Prime Minister uh, briefings that when we, they knew they were going to lock down further, then the trajectory of self-referral has just been phenomenal. We've contacted 1,500 patients to date. We started properly in December 2020, actually with all our team in place. We trickled in some of the referrals from June last year, but we've also got nearly 800 patients on trial now across the UK. So 
your patients really want this and they're really complex patients as well they're not the simple patients that we expected there's been a bit of quite a bit of talk about prehabilitation mdts and how you manage the more complex patients does anyone have any experience of that or any thoughts about how best to run those for the maybe more complex specialist patients? We don't have MDTs in a formal arrangement, but we do, as a prehab team, discuss our patients on a regular basis. So I kind of guess informally we have that arrangement. It's still a challenge to get all of the relevant stakeholders together in one place to discuss people in that way in the lead up to the journey to surgery or treatment. So I think we're maybe about 40% of the, of the way there. I don't know whether uh, Stefan and Sandy have more experience of that, but we certainly as a prehab team have regular informal kind of MDT with you like across all of the relevant people. It's just getting the surgeons and others engaged that is the next step for us. Stefan, Sand, anything to add to that? So we have our right. uh, key team, prehabilitation team of about 10 specialists. And we do have a prehab center, how Franco Carly also started, where every patient is being tested and screened first. And when there is another specialist needed, uh, for example, to treat anemia or diabetes, then we refer or we go to another specialist, but we don't have an MDT as well. There's some questions starting to come through on Slido. An interesting one first about, this is really about the integration again between primary and secondary care. It says, hi, I'm an anesthetist. My husband is a GP. When we discuss prehab, who would be the principal carer, overall principal carer in the pathway? Would it be the GP or the surgeon or the physician? And what would be the end point or where would it be if there is any? Which is a very good question and difficult to answer. Oh, it's a very good question because that's actually where we are very busy with now because we are creating our nationwide primary care network. How it works is money driven at, at the moment in the Netherlands. So it's still medical specialists referred prehab. That means that a medical specialist can refer a patient also to a physiotherapist in primary care to get trained, but it needs that referral. In the end, I think if the money goes uh, in other direction as well, that the end point is that any health professional can refer as long as there is the right indication. From experience as well, it varies in not only different nations, but in different areas and depending on where the enthusiasm for prehab has first arisen, um, if it was in primary care or, or in secondary care. I think communication across the two is probably one of the key elements. There's another question here saying, with the greater the pop proportion of the population now being unfit, the capacity of directly supervised prehab programs may be somewhat overwhelmed. What is the best way to maximize compliance within a universal, i.e. advice uh, exercise pathway? So any ways you can improve adherence to exercise or diet advice? Yes, yeah, so delivering this, making every contact counts and healthy conversations so that whoever delivers the interventions has the conversation about supportive self-management and self-efficacy. That's really the missing link. Now, I think some clinicians aren't still really very clear about what self-efficacy is. Would you mind just giving us a lay definition and what we mean by that exactly? Self-efficacy is that you take responsibility to manage your own lifestyle, but moreover, healthy conversations would have the conversation, Sandy, why don't you exercise? Well, because I'm too busy, or why are you too busy? You need to look at your diary. And you then analyze why you can't fit something in that's so important to your life. And you look at your barriers together with a professional to be able to have a multidisciplinary decision how you should be able to improve your lifestyle. Yeah, I think I agree. It goes back to choices. If we want to maximise the offer and uh, we have to have an offer that meets a variety of needs uh, from a patient perspective. Some people work, they can't come to the class at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday morning. Other people are digitally enabled, others are digitally excluded. So we have to kind of come up with a range of options which are attractive, enjoyable uh, for patients to engage with. And I think I think the pandemic, has, as I've alluded to, has given us a big opportunity to explore very quickly some of these uh, other areas. And I suspect in the future that uh, there was a question, I think, in this morning session about artificial intelligence and technology support in prehab. And I think moving forwards, uh, as I briefly alluded to in my talk about prime time, but I think it's going to play a big role in the future. 
Um, we're probably not quite there with enough medical grade technology, but I think we're definitely pretty close now. And I think this will give us a lot of potential for the future because patients who exercise at home, the feedback we get is that they often lack self feedback. Um, and that feedback as to progression is really important for them. And I think people who do cho choose that remote option in future will get quite big re personal rewards from uh, te technological support like Fitbits and, and other things, even if it's simply increasing your step count, for example. Exactly. And it seems a good moment to bring in Professor Dan Engelman from the University of Massachusetts in the States. Dan is a cardiac surgeon and has experience of implementing, in the first instance, enhanced recovery nationally in the States after cardiac surgery, but also as we've been talking about the use of large data sets, what large database collection can offer for patients before cardiac surgery for prehab. Hi, Dan, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate the introduction and the invitation to speak with this astute panel. Thank you. I just wondered if you had any experience with your cardiac patients of using remote exercise or any of these sorts of assessments during the pandemic? We have. So the pandemic actually was a silver lining in that now people are much more comfortable with Zoom type interactive virtual sessions with their doctors. They, in the midst of the pandemic, didn't even want to come to the hospital postoperatively to get their stitches out. So moving that now into an arena where we suddenly had some real time to do prehabilitation because our surgeries were delayed, we stopped our elective surgeries. And in the mm -hmm. United States, historically, we uh, find a patient ready for surgery and then we rush to get them on the schedule before either our competitors put them on the schedule or they get cold feet. So that's changed, which is good. <laughs> it gave us time to screen patients and uh, look at which patients possibly uh, could be uh, optimized for surgery. But I'll be honest, the cardiac surgeons, at least in North America that I deal with, and I'm guessing around the world, are not particularly adept at the topic of prehabilitation. Would you agree with that assessment, this panel? Uh well, yes, one wouldn't want to be judgmental, but it's been adopted <laughs> more in non-cardiac surgery as the early adopters. It probably, they haven't been the early adopters in the UK either, I don't think. There's been more interest in the optimization of the coma. They were early leaders in the optimization of anemia, for example, in the UK, certainly. As we were discussing earlier today, uh, the importance of optimizing diabetes, I think there's probably just been a bit less focused on health behaviors and exercise to date. But there have also been understandable concerns for some of your urgent cardiac patients about uh, the risk benefit ratio of exercise uh, with, uh, with critical, for example, coronary artery disease. So I think sometimes that there's been anxiety around the safety of exercise um, in some of those patient cohorts. I don't know. Right. As um, so how first, you yeah, that. we have to show the data. I mean, the, the Canadians have been doing this for a long time and they know which patients can wait for surgery and which can't, and that it's safe with certain disease states to do certain types of exercise and delay your surgery. So we first have to get that data out there, which exists. But then we also have to talk about other key components, such as, you know, in cardiac surgery, there are basically six things we really need to screen for. We need a perfect screening tool, which we're now trying to do through AI type informatics, where we look for patients who are malnourished, who have poor diets, patients who don't exercise, they're frail, hazardous alcohol use, cigarette smoking, anemia, as you talked about, and glucose control. And those are the six. And we have to just keep repeating to the heart surgeons, we need to screen for these six and put them into their appropriate categories. And I might also uh, add to that uh, anxiety. That's another one that we think is important, lowering their anxiety. And then we also need to point out to the heart surgeons that not only with patients who are in prehab programs, can we decrease their length of stay, but it increases the proportion of patients which will do a post-operative cardiac rehab program. So that's a direct not benefit immediately. Kind of not only will they get out of the hospital quicker, but they will actually uh, enroll. Yeah, so, you know, huge benefits for the health system and for the individual patient. The presence of rehab is probably more established, certainly in the UK in cardiac surgery than for many of the cancer cohorts that we've done a lot of work with recently. 
I, I just wondered if, from the other panelists, the experience or the feedback from patients who have been in prehabilitation programs and then have a surgery and don't know uh, and, and want to engage again in exercise post-operatively. What's your experience been of that smooth transition or, or is it not that smooth yet? Uh, not that smooth. Uh, GP referrals certainly or the signposting to other services has been challenging. Patients absolutely want to continue to do exercise programs and live healthily after their surgery and they say they feel dumped at the end of the trial when we can no longer support them. But in England, it's not that easy. It is improving. Different centres are now setting up these systems and, and supporting people. Uh, and again, I think that we've got the pandemic to thank for that in a way, because there's a recognition that it's important to be fit physically, metabolically and psychologically. So I think it, we've got a long way to go. And transitioning prehab to rehab sh should ab absolutely be business as usual, because if you're promoting behaviour change and asking the people to change their behaviour and then not supporting them after uh, we've supported them as a partner throughout this. I, th I think it's, it's, uh, it's a wasted opportunity. Thank you. Stefan, did you have any thoughts of your experience? Is that a, a smooth transition? Yeah, I think that's one of the next steps as, as well. We've now started uh, the first study that addresses the full continuum of care, so it's including the prehab program, rehab, but then still patients are coming back to me and I don't get any advice or letter or anything that helps them or helps me to continue their lifestyle changes. So it's a good way that there's now studies going to cover the in-hospital pathways and different blocks. We still need the conversation and bridge between our primary and hospital care as well. A lot of the importance of this is letting patients know what to expect just with educational information at different stages of their perioperative journey and this continuum. Some work recently completed by one of our, driven by one of our orthopedic surgeons has been delivering essentially what you might call digital joint school. So it's not in the cancer arena, it's prior to lower limb arthroplasty work, but has shown having a kind of package of care from pre to rehab has shown some, across a reasonable data set, has shown some quite good results for engagement. This is all delivered kind of uh, remotely via a digital platform, but provided them with exercises virtually, just information about what to expect at certain stages of their recovery, their hospital care, etc. That really seems to have given them a lot of self-empowerment. So I think there's some pretty simple things that we can do just to really enhance the knowledge of patients about what to expect and what they should be doing at different time stages and when to contact us if they're, if they're struggling. Doing this virtually safe is not just for surgical patients, it's for patients with a suspicion of a cancer or a di cancer diagnosis. We pause the intervention if they're undergoing surgery or cancer treatments, uh, and then we start again as soon as they're fit enough to do. The ethos is there. I think we, we are trying to do this, but it's going to be quite difficult to do this, I think, in not in the virtual world. I think it's the systems don't allow us at the moment to do this. But in the UK, if we started to be the integrated care system, then it might improve. If you want to change the cardiac surgeons and get them more excited about prehab, we need data. We need trials that prove that enrolling in a prehabilitation, a vigorous trial, that uh, enrolling in a in a prehabilitation uh, program and for which subset of patients is it just the frail is it slightly frail is it the non-frail is it is, which subset of these high risk vulnerable patients and prove that we can get them out of the hospital quicker safer and back to their baseline status quicker until we have that you're not really going to convince cardiac surgeons i can tell you that uh, our hospital board has made a very interesting mind change in that so it just got published last week that the hospital board just considered prehabilitation important for all surgical tracks. So by that decision, we now got rid of the difference between treatment tracks or the numbers that we had to came up with to address more the importers or to convince other professionals to implement prehab. So. If you ask me uh, to summarize that, I think we 
uh, started to think less and to measure less and just by doing it because we believe that that lifestyle change and prehabilitation can be beneficial for almost every patient there are a lot of people on that journey at the minute dan you know there are three or four multi-center studies that have been going on and have been as you can imagine massively disrupted by the pandemic uh, and the problem is with their complex it's a complex intervention and they're reasonably complex clinical trials to complete so they've taken time so but we do hope that from the westfit program which sadly got interrupted and now the safe fit program and the program the study that stefan's been involved with the international prehab trial uh, we will get more multi-center data demonstrating impact both on complications length of stay cost effectiveness there's hopefully some light at the end of the tunnel from that perspective there's at least one single center study which suggests that's the case but i know uh, i hope that there will be more data shortly to help con convince and there's some questions come through again on slido i just wanted to put to the panel i think uh, something we've all noticed is that the patients that are presenting for surgery now tend to be less fit because they've been self-isolating and there is urgency because they have cancer and we need to proceed to surgery given there have already been delays so can the panel give some tips about maximizing fitness in the minimum, minimum amount of time, i.e. two to four weeks? Well, we all know that if you've only got two weeks, it needs to be supervised hip training. How we do that, I don't know. And perhaps that's what NHSE, our health service, should be focusing on more than the early diagnosis. I think they're equally as important. But we do know that we can get people fit uh, through Safe Fit. So I, I honestly, it's a very big challenge, Danny. Stefan, any thoughts? Not really. <laughs> so, uh, well, I, I, I'm always more optimistic than the rest of you. If you haven't got a prehab, you know, you're not going to harm someone with advice. And personally, you know, where there isn't a prehab full program available, but you have a short period of time, it's about giving advice that's targeted to the patient. So find out what their baseline is. And if you haven't got a, can't do a six minute walk test or a CPET, you can start with something as simple as a, an objective physical activity, DASI score, that can give you an estimated VO2 peak. It can give you somewhere to start from to target your exercise program to that patient. And actually, you can write down an exercise prescription that's based on intervals and explain to the patient that they need to get out of breath. And if you wanted to mimic the trials that have been most clinically effective, as Sandy and Stefan's trials and, and Jerry's have previously shown three times a week, building up to 20 minutes of exercise where they get breathless and wouldn't be able to sustain a conversation with a warm up for a couple of minutes and a warm down. And again, you obviously have to start, you have to find out what your patient is capable of because it, there is data to suggest that if you overwhelm the patient by expecting them to do too much immediately, they may not do it. The best way to get the frail patient fit from the literature would be, as Sandy said, to bring them in and supervise them or do it virtually supervised. But if that's not available, tailored advice towards interval-based aerobic exercise would be what we would recommend. Certainly in our sense of Stefan, what would you say? Yes, I, I do have one more practical advice. That's the network we are creating now, is that we had quite a lot loss in referral time. So from the moment that the specialist referred to the program and the physiotherapist started training with the patient, so it, it could have been a week or two weeks. And if you have only three to two weeks to train, that's a big loss. So what we created now is that we offered a health professional to train the patient and that they have the obligation to get in contact with the patient within one day. And if they didn't, the referral goes to another one. So in that way, we make a very short referral time and patients start training as soon as they are referred. Uh, I think there's another question here from Mark Cole, sort of summarizing it. I think really is asking, as yet, is there any long-term data to suggest that preoperative surgical prehab impacts health behaviors in the long term? So not just looking at short-term surgical outcomes, but is the behavior change sustained and does that impact future health resource use? I'm not aware it's of not, any long-term follow-up there. Um, in that respect. It's, it's not in the surgical population, but in the cancer population, the Horizon trial has shown long-term behaviour change. So you would imagine that it would be similar if we used a, a similar model. 
So that's from the Macmillan literature that we could certainly send out the references if needed. Um, so, so if the panel were designing a new prehab service, what outcome measures would you use to show benefit? In cardiac surgery, uh, you know, everybody's looking to save money. So length of stay, time to ambulation, uh, and the percent of patients that can go home versus a skilled nursing facility are just clear wins. And that will just save immediate money right off the top. Uh, but we like the six minute walks, also something very measurable. Yeah, for the general fitness, I do like the DAISY questionnaire. And Jerry? The one that's being looked at, I think, is the PAM. Uh, a lot of um, NHS people are looking at the personal activation measure, which I think is a measure of self-efficacy that, um, that Sandy alluded to early on. And it's uh, that's something that's been giving a lot of um, interest presently um, and is very acceptable to patients. So I think if we're saying that it's to look at effectiveness and cost effectiveness, then days alive and out of hospital because it takes into account the patient, the surgical procedure, and then good and bad days at home and touches on social care. Perhaps in it's more applicable to uh, England or the UK, but I think that's probably an overall composite measure of what we're trying to look at and achieve. Okay, and then finally, I, I'd like to thank you all for your contribution. It's been a great session. I hope the audience agree. But last thought, I just wondered if you had each of you one tip for someone trying to set up a new prehab service uh, that would help them on their way. So starting with you, Jerry. I would say to talk to all of the relevant people and get the, the early adopters on board as soon as possible and don't, don't spend too long trying to convince the people that you don't think are going to be convinced. Get, get the people who you can, the influencers, and then you'll get the, the surge of change will happen um, once you get those people on board. Sandy, what do you what would you say? Listen to patients most of all, and look at your workforce because there's a cost-effective workforce out there that is being developed. Great, and Stefan? Integrate the uh, healthcare systems, so also primary care and uh, the health insurers, and also patients. Finally, Dan. I would say we need to look at novel implementation techniques using informatics, our electronic medical records, and telehealth in order to figure out a way to do this without having to bring patients into the hospitals. Excellent. Thank you all very much. It gives me great pleasure to bring uh, the last main session to a close. Uh, and thanks for your contributions. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence based perioptive medicine we'd love you to find out more about that if you check out ebpom.org you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home check out ebpom.org now